Well, have you ever been at odds with someone else? It doesn't matter whether you were in the right or you were in the wrong. Uh, you can probably think, though, of, of a time that, that maybe there was someone that, uh, that you had been in an argument with. Maybe you had wronged them or, or they had wronged you, but, uh, but there was stress, there was, there was tension in, in your relationship. Have you ever then moved on with life? and put it behind you and you thought everything was great, uh, that maybe the, the relationship hadn't been mended, but you were okay with life and you were ready to move on. Imagine being in a stadium uh, with 60 other, 60,000, 60 other people would be kind of weird, in a stadium with 60,000 other people. Back in the mid nineties, I found myself in a stadium like that in Atlanta. I moved on with my life and I looked and they're moving toward me was somebody that I was familiar with, somebody that, that I had been at odds with. Oh, my heart sank, and I wanted to crawl under my seat. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Or maybe you're minding your own business, shopping at your favorite store, and there down the aisle you see someone that in the past you've been at odds with. How do you feel? What emotions go through your mind? What emotions go through your heart? Joseph. Joseph of the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 42, we see that, that Joseph had moved on with his life. We've been looking at his life over the, the past months now, and, and Joseph went through some pretty rough times. He had been in Egypt for 12 years, in, in Genesis 41, we, we find the account of, of, of Joseph finally getting to a place where he was the governor of Pharaoh's wealth in Egypt. He had married and he had two children. Uh, the first was named Ephraim, which means God has made me forget. If we were to name our child Ephraim today in, in English rather than Hebrew, we might say his name is Amnesia. God has made me forget my past. His second son was named Manasseh. And Manasseh means God has caused me to be fruitful. We might pick a name like Bounty. Can you imagine having two children named Amnesia and Bounty? Every time you called them, you would be reminded that you had moved on in your life. Joseph was the ruler of Pharaoh's wealth. They had entered a time of great famine that Joseph had warned about, and they had set aside lots of grain. And as the famine took over the, the land of Egypt and the entire region, people began to come to Joseph to buy grain. Imagine that you're Joseph standing where you stand as you sell the grain, and you look across the sea of people coming to you for food, and there you see ten guys coming your way. And you recognize them immediately as your brothers. Your brothers who abused you and threw you in a well, who plotted to kill you and then sold you into slavery. These brothers took your robe, an ornamented robe, and tore it to pieces, dipped it in blood. And Joseph, you don't know this, but they took it back to your father Jacob and said he's been killed by wild beasts. You look out across the crowd. And there are the people that you've chosen to forget. Not just one, but ten. How do you respond? How did Joseph respond? If you have your Bibles, it would be great if, if you would open to Genesis chapter 42. And in this chapter, we'll see that, that the past has a way of catching up with us. As much as we'd like to forget whether we were the person that wronged another or we were the person that was wrong, our past has a way of catching up with us. And when we're face to face with our past, how might you respond? Joseph sets a great example for us. Look in, in Genesis 42, verse one, we, we see the famine reached into Canaan where Jacob and his sons were. 
uh, Jacob, Joseph's father. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at each other? He's saying, what are you doing standing around? There's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Verse three, then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother. He was the youngest one because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel, Jacob's sons, were among those who went to buy grain for the famine in the land was in Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the one who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Do you remember the dream that Joseph had when he was a young man? This was the fulfillment of this dream, the brothers bowing down to Joseph. This was the thing that angered them so. Verse seven, as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? He asked, from the land of Canaan to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, you're spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my Lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. Our youngest is now with our father and one is no more. How would you respond if you were in this situation? Well, Joseph was physically reunited in the same place with his brothers. The relationship was still very, very broken. You may remember that the brothers treated Joseph harshly. They were jealous of him. Uh, scripture says that Jacob believed uh, that Joseph was the favored son, treated him the best. But these brothers, Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Zebulun and Gad and Asher and Dan and Naphtali stood before Joseph, the youngest brother Benjamin, left at home. Now, these brothers had done Joseph great harm. And I imagine that in those moments, all of those events were relived by Joseph. You know how it is. In an instant, you can be flooded with a huge number, number of memories. It must have been this way for Joseph. In verse 14, Joseph said to them, it's just as I told you, you're spies, and this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your younger brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you're telling the truth. If you are not as surely as Pharaoh lives, you're spies. And he put all of them in custody for three days. Now these 10 brothers were terrified, I imagine, not because they knew that this was Joseph, but because they were thrown in the Egyptian prison. They said to one another, surely we're being punished. This is the conversation that, that they had with each other. Surely we're being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we wouldn't listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. Now Reuben, uh, Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now you have to give an accounting for his blood. They didn't realize that Joseph could understand them because he was using an interpreter. Joseph turned away from them and began to weep. I imagine his, his emotions were filled with, with all kinds of things as, as he heard the words of his brothers recounting the day that he was sold into slavery. The day that he was left for dead, he turned from them and began to weep, but he turned back and spoke to them. He had Simeon taken from them and bound them before their eyes. Now Joseph, 
Joseph knew what these brothers had done. They had no idea the situation that they were in, but their past caught up with them. Joseph's brothers had become captives of their past. Joseph's brothers had become captives of their own brutality. All 10 were involved in the deception. Simeon and Reuben tried to look for another way out, but in the end, they were all compliant with Joseph being left for dead, sold into slavery, and they were hostages of their own deception. Have you ever lived with a lie for such a long period of time that you live with an underlying fear that you'll be found out? I believe that the brothers lived this way every day. As they looked into their father's eyes and saw the sadness that, that he had experienced because there's his son, his son Joseph, uh, as far as he knew, was dead. I'm sure that every conversation was an echo of what took place as Joseph was thrown in the well and then sold into slavery. Every time Joseph's name came up at the dinner table, the theatrics began as they remembered their lines, as they played off their cues, the charade that Joseph was dead. They had presented their father with evidence, and I imagine that every conversation was a reminder of what they had done to Joseph. The brothers were hostages of a broken relationship. They were captive in a broken relationship with their dad, captive in a broken relationship with Joseph, captive in a broken relationship with each other. It seems that each snapshot we get of these 10 brothers, they were always quarreling, always at odds with their common enemy being Joseph. It's terrifying to be held captive. I remember when, when I was five years old, I was at Bob and Jesse Sylvester's house, a family in, in, in our church, and they had some kind of event at their house. I don't remember what it was, but all of the kids at the church, or from the church, were there. And, and we were in one big room, it was kind of the play area, and there was a, a chest of drawers, and in the bottom drawer were all the toys. And I can remember Danny and Kara Baker and, and Chris Fry and, and other kids, and we were pulling all the toys out, and Chris Fry said something to me like, I bet you can't fit in that drawer. And Chris is, is a year younger than me. Um, and, and, and Chris said, you know, I bet you can't fit in the drawer. And I said, well, sure I can. I didn't back down from a challenge. And I slipped into the drawer. And as soon as I did, Chris pushed the door, the drawer shut. And I remember panicking and thinking, okay, you know, be calm. Don't freak out. But of course, I freaked out and I began screaming and yelling and kicking with my Buster Brown shoes on. And I, I don't know how long I was stuck in the drawer, but I do remember Chris laughing and running off. And I was there for what seemed like an eternity until one of the adults heard me and figured out what drawer I was in and let me out. Now, physically and emotionally and spiritually, all of us have been a captive in in one way or another. Now, we may not have been uh, captive physically for a long period of time, if you were ever held captive, but you probably know what it's like to be captivated by emotions. You know the toll that it takes on you over time. All of us have been captive spiritually. Scripture tells us that we're born into this world captives to sin and death, and all of us need someone who will ransom us. Over time, Joseph saw that the faithful God that he served was his Redeemer. And in the pages of Scripture, we see that Jesus is the one who came to free us and to ransom us spiritually. All of us have been spiritual captives. And my prayer is that all of us know Christ is our Savior, the one who gave his life for us. We were memorizing a verse that, that talks about that. In Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2, once we've placed our faith in Christ, this is the freedom that we experience. Scripture says, we have been raised with Christ, so set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. 
Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Here during these days in Joseph's life, he had to rely on the wisdom and the patience that God was giving to him to deal with his brothers as they stood as they were before him. Joseph, we see, when faced with his brothers, refused to be captivated by his past. Joseph, in, in verse 25, Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack, and to give them provisions for their journey. After all this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys, and they left. Now Joseph extended grace and mercy uh, toward them. He acted shrewdly toward his abusers. He showed them grace and mercy, but he acted with wisdom as they were sent off. Simeon, one of the brothers, was held in prison as, uh, as an insurance that, that they would eventually come back. Joseph could have arrested them, imprisoned them for life. He could have executed them on the spot. But he feared God, and he knew that by going through uh, this tough time of waiting on God's timing, that he would be rewarded. Joseph was shrewd in the way that he acted toward those who had abused him. And now, we can be shrewd in the way that we act toward people that have harmed us, and, and that shrewdness shows up when we lean into the mercy and the grace of God, but we prevent ourselves from being placed in a a situation where we might be abused again. Joseph, Joseph could have exercised his power and snuffed out their lives, but he waited on God's timing. He provided for his enemies out of the storehouse of Egypt. He provided for their journey home and he replaced their silver. Now grace recognizes the pain that we've gone through in the past Forgiveness covers over that past and extends mercy to those who have harmed us. We see that in the way that Joseph dealt with his brothers. He longed for healing. He winced from the pain, and yet he bore up underneath the suffering and extended to them grace and mercy. Joseph bore the full frontal assault of their crimes, the viciousness of the past, and yet he leaned deeply into the grace that the Holy Spirit was giving to him. How tough is it for you? How tough is it for us to extend forgiveness to people that have harmed us? I can tell you for me, there are certain folks that come to mind over my 54 years of life on this earth, where if not for the grace of God, I would get so angry at what has been done. And I imagine that there are people that I have harmed as well. And when they think of me, anger broils up within them. Friends, we cannot be captive of our past. We have to lean into the mercy and the grace that God shows toward us. Is it painful? You bet. And yet forgiveness is one of the markers that we are called to as followers of Christ. In verse 27, at the place where the brothers stopped for the night, one of them opened the sack to feed their donkey, and he saw his silver was in the mouth of the sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here, it's in my sack. Their hearts sank, and they turned to each other, trembling, and said, What is this that God has done to us? The conviction of what they had done was weighing upon them. When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them. They said, this man who is Lord over the land spoke harshly to us and treated us as though we were spying on the land. But we said to him, we're honest men, we're not spies. We were 12 brothers, sons of one father. One is no more and the youngest is now with our father in Canaan. Then the man who is Lord over the land said to us, this is how I will know whether you're honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me and take food for your starving households and go, but bring your youngest brother to me 
so that I will know you're not spies, but honest men. Then I will give your brother back to you, and you can trade here in the land. The plans that the brothers had to get on with their lives 12 years before, their plan began to unravel, and the consequences once again hit their father hard. As they were emptying their sacks, there in each man's sack was a silver pouch. When they and their father saw the money pouches, they were frightened. And listen how their father Jacob replied. You have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more the one held in prison. And now you want to take Benjamin? Everything is against me. Now remember, this is Jacob. He wrestled earlier in his life with the angel of God. He had an encounter with God. God promised that he would be faithful to him. And yet the pain of these decades now robbed Jacob of his optimism. Jacob was overcome with pain, and he was paralyzed with fear of the future. Jacob's fears were fueled by this continuation of the son's lies and in the turmoil of all of this, he forgot that his God was faithful, and he said, everything is against me. Have you ever felt like that? When your plans for life begin to unravel, when your past catches up with you, how does God want you to respond? How does God want you to respond when you've hurt someone else, as you seek their forgiveness? How does God want you to respond when your abusers come face to face with you and you have the opportunity to forgive them? Boy, those are hard things to do in life. I am so grateful that God shapes us over a long period of time to make us more like Christ. You and I don't always forgive well. Is that true? You and I don't always extend mercy well. And yet consistently in Scripture, we see God's great redemption and his forgiveness shown toward you and me through Christ. And Christ sets the ultimate example for us. In being one who was abused over and over again, harmed by the words and the actions of others, eventually crucified, he sets the example by forgiving us and making us part of his family. How might you need to lean into the mercy and the grace of Jesus as we go through life, as we navigate times good and bad? May the words of Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, be words of encouragement to you as you wrestle with forgiving and as you wrestle with being forgiven. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Jesus, I thank you that you give us examples over and over again in Scripture of people who blow it, people who mess up, people who harm others. And yet, Jesus, you call us to receive your forgiveness so that we might be an agent of healing and restoration to people around us. Forgive us for the things that we've done to harm others. And I pray that we would quickly extend forgiveness to those who have harmed us us. Holy Spirit, thank you for residing in us. Thank you for living within us to make us more like Christ. It's in his name that I pray. Amen.